backwards how much. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samasambuddhasa Namo Good morning, everybody. Today is April 24, 2010. Okay, we've been doing sutta, uh, studying sutta number 22 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake. And so far we've completed two classes on the sutta. <clears throat> and in the last class I did the presentation of the standard, call this the argument or logical proof, you could say, of the teaching of anatta or non-self. So it's not really intended to be a logical proof or a logical demonstration, but it's a kind of guide to contemplation and to insight. So I just want to go over this argument again, just because this will lead on to the next sections of the sutta. So here we're on page 232, paragraph 26. So the Buddha begins by investigating what are called the five aggregates. The five aggregates are the five groups of factors that constitute a living being, a sentient being. So what we refer to as ourselves, what we are, our personal identity, is a collection of these five aggregates. But it's not just you know, a chance collection, like taking five different types of stones and putting them into a pile. But we have to understand that these five factors are always interwoven, interdependent, supporting and conditioning one another. And because they're interwoven so closely, we habitually, through beginningless time, we grasp upon this collection of factors as being a real self, a real I, a truly existing personal I. And according to the Buddha's teaching, it's this grasping of the idea of I that is the prime manifestation of ignorance and clinging. And it's this grasping of the idea of I, of self, that keeps us in bondage to samsara, the round of birth and death. And so in order to bring liberation from samsara, the Buddha has to teach the way to direct insight into the selfless nature of the five aggregates. And now he does this by basing his presentation on two other characteristics of the five aggregates that are easier to see, easier to understand. These two other characteristics are impermanence and dukkha, or suffering or unsatisfactoriness. And so of all of these three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, and non-self, 
the one which is most immediately evident is impermanence. Maybe it seems to us that our body, our states of mind are lasting through time, but when one develops very sharp mindfulness and concentration and then attends to the body and the mind, then one could see how they are constantly arising, changing and passing away. And so the Buddha starts with the first aggregate, which is called the aggregate of material form. This is physical form, or well, the body, the substance, the factor that makes up the body. And then he asks the monks, what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? Then the monks answer, it's impermanent. Okay, not only in the sense that the body grows old and dies, that is, you can say, that's the gross aspect of impermanence. But the subtle aspect of impermanence is that the form of the body, it's always changing. So even as I hold my hand out here, if I really pay close attention to the hand, I can feel within the hand always changing sensations. Those changing sensations indicate that the material substance of the hand is always changing. So we know from, even this is supported by modern biology, if we look into the nature of the body, we see the body, it's made up of little cells, and then the little cells are made up of a kind of substance, cytoplasm, protoplasm, and different types, there's a nucleus, cytoplasm. And if we look at it through a high-powered microscope, we see always it's a <laughs> beehive of activity. Even when we're sound asleep, not aware of anything in the world, but billions of processes are going on in every cell in the body. So things are coming into being say the protoplasm that's being produced, other protoplasm is being destroyed and cleared out. Okay, so everything in form is impermanent. Then the Buddha asks us, what is impermanent? It's better in the Pali, dukkha or sukha. It doesn't really mean, is it suffering or happiness in the usual sense, but is it, you could say, is it unpleasurable or pleasurable. And if one looks into the nature of impermanence, we see that things that are always changing, passing away, perishing, they're not really a, a basis for security, for happiness, for well-being. Things are always undependable. Like one day you can be in the peak of health, to happy, joyful, vigorous. Then you get a little itching in the throat. And at night you feel a fever coming on. And the next day you're lying in bed, oh, miserable. <laughs> of course, the misery changes when you recover from the cold and you feel strong and vigorous and you think you're happy again. But eventually everything in this bodily existence ends in old age, gray hair, wrinkled skin, poor memory, feeble faculties, going blind, difficult hearing, so, and then eventual death. So it's ever impermanent. If we really look at it closely, we find even when we're in the peak of health, high point of vitality, but that even that strength and vigor and pleasure that we are experiencing, it's casting a shadow of suffering. 
And so that suffering, it's like the shadow always ready to catch up with us. And so therefore it's unsatisfactory or dukkha. So material form is impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, and then it's constantly undergoing change. And so then the Buddha says, is this fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. So if this body is always changing, unsatisfactory, and bound to be given up, to be relinquished, can we say this is myself? And here maybe in the Western or the Western way of thinking, we could say, yeah, this is myself. But against the background of the Indian way of thinking, what is called the self, the atta in Pali, the atma in Sanskrit, this is always assumed to be something which is permanent, which exists forever, and which is in perfect command of itself. So it's a source of, we could say, a source of po inner power, a source of control and mastery of, over itself, and capable of lasting forever. And so if this body, material form, changes, we can't command it and master it to our liking, and if it eventually just breaks down and passes away, we can't say, it's mine, it's I, it's myself. So the monks say, no, venerable sir. Okay, then the Buddha raises the same questions about feeling. So what is feeling? We have three kinds of feelings. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neutral feeling, the feeling that's not pleasant, not painful. Okay, if we look at these feelings, we see the feelings are always changing from moment to moment. Like even if one is in a state of happiness, pleasant feeling, one looks into the mind and one sees that it's not just one feeling that's lasting, but it's different thoughts arising, and each thought is accompanied by its own momentary pleasant feeling. And even, say, if you're sitting in meditation for a long time, and then you feel some pain in the legs or the back, you think this pain, oh, this pain has been going on for such a long time, it's going to be going on forever. <laughs> but if you pay attention to the pain and just turn it from an annoyance into an object of observation, you see that what you call this oppressive pain is actually a sequence or series of moments of pain. One moment the pain might be really sharp, next moment it will be dull, a little dull and oppressive, the next moment it will be rising and falling very quickly, the next moment it will be sort of extending for with some degree of continuity, then it might subside, rise again, until when you really look very, very closely at the pain, it's a little bit like, kind of like a series of like radio waves or light waves just flashing into being and flashing out of being. So the feeling, it's impermanent, always changing whether pleasure or pain. And then again, because the feeling is always changing, it's unsatisfactory. So even the pleasant feelings, the joyful feelings, because they change, we have no command over them. We can't say, let me be pleasant, let me enjoy pleasure forever, let me always be happy. And so even the pleasure, it's unsatisfactory. Okay, since the Feelings are impermanent, connected to suffering, and subject to change. Again, they lack the permanence, the self-mastery, 
the continuous happiness that's to be expected of a self, of an Atman. And so the feelings too, we say, not mine, not I, not myself. And similarly, perceptions are always changing. Sometimes I'm seeing an object with the eye, sometimes I'm hearing sounds, sometimes I'm smelling an odor, tasting some, maybe some snack or food, feeling sensations with the body, thinking thoughts with the mind. So all of this is changing the perceptions. So the perceptions are impermanent, I can't always have pleasant perceptions. Sometimes there will come disagreeable perceptions. I meet people I dislike. I get into traffic jams if I'm driving. I miss my train or my plane or my bus. And my mind is upset. Okay, so I experience things that I dislike. And so the perceptions are bound up with suffering. So the perceptions, not mine, not I, not myself. Then the fourth group of factors is called the sankharas, the volitional activities, acts of will, acts of desire, planning, projecting, willing, acting, constructing, building, doing, making. All of these volitional activities arise and fall away. So, in the morning I'm planning what I'm going to have for breakfast. (laughs) When I'm eating breakfast, I'm thinking, what am I going to have for lunch? (laughs) When I finish the lunch, then I think, what am I going to have (laughs) for a snack or for a drink in the afternoon or evening? What am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? So these plans, projects, acts, deeds, always changing. And then often my desires, wishes, plans, sometimes even the deeds, they're not subject to my perfect control. So we have maybe the extreme case is they call the obsessive compulsive disorder. Like the person has an obsession that they have to wash their hands 20 times a day. And so even if they set, tell themselves, there's no reason for me to be washing my hands so often, no reason to be washing my hands so often, but I just put my hand on the table, maybe I'm getting germs. Oh, if I get the germs, I might get sick. If I get sick, then I'll run up big medical bills and be an inconvenience to my family. So, I'd better go wash my hands. (laughs) So, it happens like this. People sometimes they can't control what they want to do. Well, they can't control what they do. So this is an extreme example, but there are many examples that we all experience in our day-to-day life. So not having perfect control over the mind's desires, its undertakings, this is a form of dukkha. So volitions are impermanent, bound up with dukkha, subject to change. Therefore they're not mine, not I, not myself. And then finally consciousness, which is the awareness of all of this. Generally in the Indian tradition, There was a tendency for the thinkers, the philosophers, the sages to identify consciousness as the self, thinking that everything else changes, but the awareness is something which is like a light always shining, always bright, always persistent throughout all experience, always remaining the same. But the Buddha analyzed consciousness analytically, well, and that's totality, he analyzed consciousness analytically. He analyzed consciousness into distinct types of consciousness. And he explained that consciousness always arises based on a sense faculty. 
So there is consciousness arising through the eye, consciousness through the ear, consciousness through the nose, through the tongue, through the body, and then the inner consciousness or reflective consciousness, introspection, um, concept, conceptual consciousness, mental consciousness. Okay, so consciousness is constantly, when we look at it closely, we see it's arising and passing away. Sometimes when I'm seeing a form through the eye, then there is visual consciousness. When I hear sounds, that's auditory or hearing consciousness, and so on. So the consciousness, it's arising and passing, always changing. And so consciousness, too, is impermanent. It's connected with suffering, subject to change. So even consciousness, the Buddha says, one should see is not mine, not I, not myself. So then in paragraph 27, he brings all of us together. Now he's hitting at the crux of his teaching, at the idea or perception or insight into non-self that will knock away the clinging to the idea of self. So he says, therefore, any kind of material form, whatever, past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, not I, not myself. The same with feeling, the same with perception, the same with the mental formations, the same with consciousness. All should be seen with penetrating wisdom as not mine, not I, not myself. And so this isn't just a theory about non-self, but it's actual insight. And it's insight which serves the practical purpose. The purpose is to knock away this clinging or grasping of things, especially the five aggregates, as being mine. This is mine. As being what I am. Instead, one sees this I am not. not I'm not the body, not the feelings, not the perceptions, not the volitions, not even the consciousness. And this is not myself. So this is actually, it's a very useful contemplation. You don't even have to, it doesn't mean that you have to be like a great yogi, a great meditator to practice this. But I found this very useful in times when I get ill, when I'm lying in bed, sometimes very weak a lot of pain, sickness, then usually if one doesn't have some theme to contemplate, one just lies in bed thinking, oh, how miserable I am, why does this have to happen to me? <laughs> so everything is centering around I, me, right? <laughs> but if one brings up this idea, this is not mine, this body is not mine, the illness is not mine. This I am not. The pains, failing, the fe painful feelings, the tiredness, the exhaustion, sometimes moods of dejection. Just see it, this I am not. This is not myself. And then it becomes very liberating. Not necessarily in the sense that you gain full enlightenment and permanent liberation, but you can just endure difficult conditions in life. When you lose something of value, maybe a car that you've treasured through the years gets into an accident, 
and you can't use it anymore, or you have a disagreement with friend, an old friend and then the friendship breaks up, or your children do things you don't, what, that you don't want them to do. You just think, this is not mine. Each thing has its own way of acting. And then let them go, it helps to let go. Or you get into an argument with somebody, and then often you hold to your own position, your own opinion, thinking, I'm right, because that's my opinion, they're ex disagreeing with me, so they have to be wrong. And then you get into a fierce argument, dis different opinions clash with each other. That's because both sides are holding to their view as being mine, identifying with that view. But you just consider the view not mine, it's just an idea that's occurred to me. So let's, instead of arguing, let's just try to find out what is the, tr the truth, what is the best way of doing something. And so this idea or contemplation, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, can be very helpful. Okay, but here the Buddha is speaking about this from the standpoint of the higher wisdom. And so when the noble disciple sees this with wisdom, then he becomes disenchanted with material form disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with the volitional formations, disenchanted with consciousness. So what is meant by disenchantment here means that one is, has seen through the illusions or the enchantment of taking these five aggregates to be mind, I, myself. And when one sees through that illusion, through that enchantment, then one starts to tr inwardly turn away from them and to let go of them. So that turning away and letting go, that is what is meant by disenchantment. The Pali word is nibbida. Okay, then as one goes on seeing again and again into the impermanent, unsatisfactory, selfless nature of the five aggregates, one goes on letting go, letting go, letting go, over and over, at deeper and deeper levels, until there comes an occasion when the attachment to the five aggregates, the clinging to them, is completely broken completely over, overthrown, overturned. And that is what is called, to translate it here, dispassion, viraga. Raga literally means the color when something is dyed. That color, it's raga. It gives the coloration to a piece of fabric then when the color is completely removed from the fa fabric, that is viraga. And so this is what we translate as passion, because passion is like a color that pervades the mind. 
then when that passion, attachment is completely removed from the mind, that experience, it's viraga, dispassion. And with the ending of passion or attachment, the mind reaches vimukti, it's liberated, liberation. So this is, when we use the word liberation, it actually means the liberation from clinging. Or we could say liberation from the three asavas, the three taints, or the three, well, it's the three toxins, the three poisonous streams. What are these three poisonous streams? No. And what else? Yeah. Right, very good. So it's the clinging to sensual pleasures. That's called kamasava, the flowing of this desire for sensual pleasure. Bhavasava, the flowing of attachment to continued existence, and avijasava, the flowing of this ignorance, delusion. And when all of those three deadly streams or toxic streams dry up, that is liberation. And then he understands birth is destroyed. Now I don't like that rendering so, so much. It's more like you say the process of rebirth has been finished. The holy life has been lived. He has lived the complete life of the Noble Eightfold Path. He's done what had to be done. That is, fully removed all of the defilements of the mind. And there is no more coming back to any state of conditioned existence in the round of rebirths. Okay, now the Buddha, maybe I'll ask at this point whether there are any questions from this presentation. I, w I had done this last week, but I went through it rather quickly, too quickly, so I wanted to go through it again more slowly to help some of you <laughs> understand better. So any, any questions? Okay, there are some questions from the internet, let's see. If consciousness is always tied to the physical body, does it mean there cannot be a disembodied consciousness in the Buddha's teaching? That is, consciousness cannot leave the body. Actually, there are some passages which speak about the kind of psychic power, a spirit, spiritual power, of being able to create another body similar to this physical body, and then one can draw that other body out and send it over vast dif distances. Apparently, in that body too, there'll be the consciousness will be present, and so it can observe things that are going on at a far distance. Um, so there are various subtle things that take place, or various mind-boggling phenomena that take place in the subtle realm. How that works in relation to the physical body, I don't know the details. Okay, what is the main difference between the idea of this I am not, and this is not myself, Is this mainly about the so-called free will? Actually, free will is not really brought explicitly into this discussion, but the way the commentators explain the difference, they say that the idea, I am this, shows the working of what is called conceit. That is, it's a basic tendency to identify with things, not so much for the purpose of finding oneself but for gaining some kind of self-esteem or some reason to 
rate oneself as being better than others, worse than others, and so on. So that is, this I am, and so the idea, I am not this, has the purpose of counteracting conceit, so that one doesn't think, I am better, I am equal, I am worse. On the other hand, the idea, this is myself, it's a speculative view, a kind of theory or doctrine or belief in a self. And so the purpose is of this is not myself, is to counteract that view of a self. Okay, does liberation of the mind also mean that the mind is detached and removed from the five external sense senses connected to the physical body, as in the jhana states? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Somebody who is liberated in mind, whose mind is liberated in this sense, it means that the mind is liberated from the defilements and so the mind remains liberated under all conditions. So even if this person is engaged in the activities of day-to-day -day life, even if he's eating a delicious meal with maybe beautiful music playing off on the side and dancers dancing in front of him. So all of the five senses are being, say, provoked or stimulated but if the mind is completely liberated, then there's no craving or clinging to any of these objects of the senses. Okay, I'll skip the, there's one more question, it's a little bit tangential, because I want to come back and then finish the sutta today. Okay, so now we come to a passage where the Buddha is going to praise the liberated one with using a number of metaphors and images. So he says, this bhikkhu, this monk, is called one whose crossbar has been lifted, whose trench has been filled in, whose pillar has been uprooted, one who has no bolt, a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered. And then the Buddha is going to explain each of these images. So, paragraph 31, how is this monk one whose crossbar has been lifted? So here, I'm not sure of the exact reason, but the crossbar is identified with ignorance. I guess in houses where they want to prevent people from breaking in, they put a bar across the door. So that bar, it's compared to ignorance. And so one who has lifted the crossbar is one who has abandoned ignorance, cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it cannot arise again in the future. That is how the monk is one whose crossbar has been lifted. Okay, how is the monk one whose trench has been filled in? Okay, the trench is compared now to the round of rebirths, that is samsara. And so the monk is one who has abandoned the round of rebirths, again, cut it off at the root and so on, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. Okay, how is he one whose pillar has been uprooted? Here the pillar is a metaphor for craving. So the answer is that the monk is one who has abandoned craving, cut it off at the root, and so on. How is the monk one who has no bolt? The bolt, it's the little latch that locks the door. Here the monk has abandoned the five lower fetters, cut them off at the root, and so on, so they are no longer subject to future arising. Does anybody remember what the five lower fetters are? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's one of them, but it's not. Let's let's take them in a proper order. Some of you are veterans. You should be able. I give it a shot. Uh, personality view. Yeah, go on. Doubt. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, sense desire? Yeah. And your will? Great, wonderful, yeah. Okay, it's, sometimes it's translated personality view or identity view. In effect, this means the view of the self. Then the second is doubt. The third is, he said, clinging to rites and rituals or rules and rituals. Okay, that's one translation. It could be also clinging to different kinds of ascetic observances and so on. The fourth is sensual desire or sensual craving. And the fifth is ill will or hatred. Okay, so that is the bolt. How is the bhikkhu a noble one whose banner is lowered, burden is lowered? who is unfettered. So here what's called the banner, that's when you raise the banner, it's a way of showing, these are my credentials. <laughs> I have a PhD from this university, I worked for 20 years with this corporation, I've won these awards. You know, of course, if you have all of these honors, it's great, but sometimes you meet people <laughs> um, as soon as they say, hello, I am Bhikkhu Bodhi, he says, oh, I am so-and-so, I have a PhD from such-and-such such university, I worked for so, so many years for such-and-such. Such. I remember <laughs> meeting even a monk, he gave me his business card, you see the business card, um, president of such and such Bhikkhu Association, chief incumbent, such and such a temple, spiritual advisor to such and such a Buddhist society, uh, religious advisor to the such and such university Buddhist youth group, um, assistant director of such and such an association. It seems almost as though one face of the card was not enough. You have to turn it over. <laughs> okay, so the banner, it's the symbol for conceit, the conceit I am. And so one who has lowered the banner is one who has abandoned the conceit I am, cut it off at the root, and so on. Okay, so now the Buddha has finished describing this <coughs> liberated one, the Arahat. Okay, now we come to a few difficult passages in this sutta. The Buddha, paragraph, beginning paragraph 36, when the gods, together with Indra, with Brahma, and with Pajapati, these are the Vedic deities, Seek a monk who is thus liberated in mind, they do not find, then these words are put in brackets, I think I just added them to help the sentence, anything of which they could say, let's just keep that out, they do not find the consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone is untraceable here and now. Now the expression that's rendered here, one thus gone, in Pali, it's Tathagata.
Now the word tathagata, usually in the text, it's a epithet for the Buddha. So the Buddha, when he speaks about himself, he refers to himself as the tathagata. And it means literally one who has gone, one who has thus gone, sometimes rendered one who has gone to thusness, or one who has gone to the truth, one who has realized the truth. But in this passage, the Buddha is not restricting the word Tathagata to a fully enlightened Buddha, but to anyone who is completely liberated, to any arahat. And so he says that even the gods, sometimes they seek to understand the mind of a human being. But when they seek to understand the mind of the arahat, they don't find that mind or consciousness being supported by anything, in the sense of having any point of attachment, anything that's holding the mind down. So the mind of a liberated one, we could say, Metaphorically, it's like the sky. Sometimes even, I think it's the Dhammapada speaks about the, just as the birds fly across the sky without leaving any track in the sky. And so mental events will take place in the mind of a arahat or Buddha. They don't leave any traces or tracks And then sometimes in the suttas we find Mara. Mara is the evil one, like the devil. But he's not really evil like the Christian Satan who wants to drag people to hell. But Mara just wants to keep people bound by attachment to the realm of sensual enjoyment. And so sometimes Mara goes looking for the mind of an arahat and he searches and searches, but can't find anything. Because there's no point of attachment there. And so the Buddha says, one thus gone is untraceable here and now. And so we could see the body of an arhat, we could see him going about his day-to-day -day activities, but there's nothing that we could trace within the mind in the sense of any kind of point of clinging or attachment. Even the sense, I am, I am this, is not in the mind anymore. What that mind is like, maybe... Maybe some of you know, I don't know myself. <laughs> Still, with as long as we have a lot of attachment to I and mine, it's very difficult to know, to understand the mind, which is completely without I and mine. But because there's no attachment to I and mine, it's said that the liberated one, or the one who is gone thus, gone to the ultimate truth, is untraceable, unfindable, undiscoverable. So we see this represented in early Buddhist art from the very early period. Now whenever you hear Buddhist art, the first thing you think of is a Buddha image, right? And even any Buddhist temple, you go into the temple, and the center of the temple is the Buddha image. But in the first four centuries, three or four centuries of Buddhism, no Buddha images. There was art, there was sculpture, but when you see pieces of Buddha sculpture, there might be like a group of people, like devotees surrounding a place in the middle, which is where the Buddha should be. But instead of seeing the figure of the Buddha, all one sees is a footprint to represent the Buddha, or sometimes the Bodhi tree to represent the Buddha because they were trying to represent this idea that an enlightened one is untraceable. There are no tracks by which one could trace the liberated one.
And so how did the Buddha statue, Buddha image, come into Buddhist art? Who is responsible for that? Yeah, it was Greek colonies, colonies of people of Greek descent that had settled in an area which is now part of Pakistan and eastern Afghanistan that was called Gandhara. And so the Greeks were familiar with the practice of representing their deities with statues. And so Greek sculptures, sculptors, would make sculptures of the Buddha, who, if you have seen statues of Gandhara art, the Buddha looks very much like the Greek god Apollo. <laughs> In fact, the facial features are more Greek than Indian. Okay, so now the Buddha continues. He says, So saying, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins who say, the recluse Gotama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. But then the Buddha says, I do not proclaim this, and so I'm baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by them. Okay, so because the Buddha teaches non-self, so the Brahmins, you see, especially the Brahmins, are very strongly attached to the idea of self. And so when they hear the Buddha teaching anatta or non-self, they think the Buddha is an annihilationist. He teaches that the person at death comes to a complete annihilation, to a complete end, and there's absolutely nothing existing beyond death. And then they think that nirvana too must be the complete annihilation of an existing being. We have a real being existing, and then what happens at death is that that real being breaks up and is destroyed. But what the Buddha teaches is that there are these five aggregates that make up the living being, and the attainment of final nibbana is just the ending of this process, this conditioned process of the five aggregates. And so the Buddha says, both formally and now, what I teach is just dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. Sometimes this is translated, what I teach is only suffering and the cessation of suffering. I have to say, I don't think this is quite correct, because there's no word here which means only. That's the word that translators introduce. He says, what I teach is suffering. And that statement has to be understood not to mean that this is the entirety of what the Buddha teaches. Since the Buddha teaches many other things, he gives advice to kings on how to rule the kingdom, advice to people on how to meet together and live in harmony, advice to parents, how to treat their children. So it's not just suffering and the cessation of suffering. But this sentence has to be taken in its context. Here it's intended as a kind of reply to the accusation of the Brahmins and the ascetics who say that the Buddha teaches the annihilation of a living being, of a truly existing being. So he, the Buddha is saying, I don't teach the annihilation of an existing being. Since the existing being, that's a being misconceived as a kind of self. But what the Buddha is saying is that I te what I actually teach is that what we call the living being are these five aggregates, which are dukkha. And so the purpose of the teaching is to bring an end to this process of the five aggregates that constitutes dukkha.
And so now the Buddha is going to show the sort of subjective impact of his teaching. He says, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata on that account, the Tathagata, now he's referring to himself as the Buddha, on that account feels no annoyance, bitterness, or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata feels no delight, joy, or elation of the heart. This is very important advice, especially in the religious climate today when people become very contentious about their religious belief. You know, if you speak ill of some religious teachers, then their followers can become very angry, aggressive, hostile. And if you do it under the wrong circumstances, you can get beaten or even, I'm sorry to say, even killed. <laughs> but this is the advice of the Buddha. If, well, he's going to come to that in the next paragraph. If others abuse, revile, scold, and harass... No, he's <laughs> speaking about the the disciples now. But, okay, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata, then you yourself, the followers, shouldn't become annoyed, angry, or dejected, but just bear it. Maybe you should approve of what they say, but regard it with equanimity. And then if honor, others honor, respect, revere, and venerate the Tathagata, Again, don't become elated, like some of the Buddhists when they see Albert Einstein praise Buddhism, or who some of the others. You know, there's a book like Famous Men Who Praise Buddhism, or Praise the Buddha. Then they become very happy. Oh, Einstein praised the Buddha, or who are they, some of the others? Tiger Woods, <laughs> well, <laughs> delete, press the delete button. <laughs> uh, Richard Gere, okay, Richard Gere is a Buddhist, or um, Goldie Hawkins, is she a Buddhist? Goldie Horn, I don't know. Okay, so, excuse me? Tina Turner. Tina Turner, yeah. <laughs> Who? Katie Lyon. KT Lang. Lang. Yeah, but Robert Thurman is famous as a Buddhist scholar. What we mean is somebody who's famous in another capacity. Who? A Bertrand Russell, yeah. Did he actually praise Buddhism or did he just criticize? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Excuse me? That's what he said. Okay. Okay. So then we get all excited and happy. Oh, so and so praised Buddha or Buddhism. So he says, you shouldn't become elated, delighted, and uplifted in the heart. Okay, so when they honor the Buddha, then the Buddha thinks they perform such services as these simply in regard to what was earlier fully understood. In other words, they revere him on the basis of his wisdom and understanding, so he doesn't take it personally. And then he gives the same advice to the monks. You should behave in the same way. Okay, now we come into the next section which is again the kind of returning to this theme of non-self. So we're getting it hammered at us from different angles, repeatedly brought home to us from different angles. The Buddha says, Therefore, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Okay, this seems reasonable, sensible, rational, 
But now the Buddha says, what is it that is not yours? Material form, the body is not yours. What are you saying, man? The body isn't mine. Abandon it. No. I have to put on some of the dye to make my hair look <laughs> dark. It's getting gray. <laughs> I have to put on some tanning lotion so people will think I've been down to Florida sunbathing. <laughs> I have to work out with the weights to make myself look strong and muscular. How, do, how can you say, give up the body? Why give up the body? Then the Buddha says, when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Then feeling is not yours, abandon it. Perception is not yours, abandon it. The volitional formations are not yours, abandon them. So then I think I've given up all of those things. At least I have my own consciousness to hold to. That's mine. But then the Buddha says, consciousness is not yours. Wait a minute, Buddha. <laughs> I have to have something, right? But the Buddha says, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So the Buddha is saying, give up everything that you might become attached to from the form of your body right through to the inner depths of your consciousness. Then he illustrates this with a simile. He says, if people carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves in the rock garden at Zhuangyan Monastery, or burned them, or did what they liked with them, would you think people are carrying us off, or burning us, or not doing what they like with us? What do you think? <laughs> you see, in the rock garden, there are places where the wind broke off some of the branches from the trees, now, if Mr. Wang, the uh, man who takes care of the grounds here, if he collects these broken branches and trees and puts them in a pile, carries them away and puts them in a pile to be taken off the grounds of the monastery, do you think they're taking away what's yours? <laughs> taking me away? Why not? The monks say, because that is neither our self nor what belongs to our self, right? And so the Buddha says, in the same way, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And what is not yours, again, the same material form, through consciousness. Okay, then finally now, coming to the end of the sutta, the Buddha is going to show, having gone through and given special emphasis here to his teaching of non-self, now he's going to show how in his teaching there are <coughs> disciples who have reached the different levels of enlightenment, awakening, realization, beginning from the top. So he says, this Dhamma is well proclaimed by me. It's clear, open, evident, free of patchwork. It's a very significant expression. Like we have a piece of clothing, you know, elbows get worn out, like a jacket or shirt, and so we put a patch over the elbows, then we get a little tip. Buttons break off, so we have to tie on and sew on new buttons. We get a little tear over on the front. We have to sew it up or put a patch over it. And so it's all patched together, sewn together. But this dhamma, it's like a piece of whole cloth. 
There's nothing like inconsistent in it, nothing with internal contradictions. There are no, you know, embarrassing weak spots so that we have to defend it, like say, oh, yeah, this has to be interpreted in this way, we shouldn't take this too literally. Of course, there are some things that shouldn't be taken too literally, but those are not the essential things. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to show that in this Dhamma, which is clear, open, and so on, there are monks who are arahats. These are ones whose taints have been destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the goal, destroyed the fetters of becoming, and are liberated through final knowledge. And so for these, the Buddha says, there is no future round of existence to be manifested. So that is the highest level of attainment. Okay, now the Buddha is going to go down step by step. Okay, now again in this Dhamma, which is open and clear, he says there are monks, and not only monks, we also have to understand in this case there will be monks, bhikkhunis, nuns, and also male and female lay disciples who have abandoned the five lower fetters. So we came across the five lower fetters already. And so these are what we call non-returners. They're due to take rebirth, not in the sensual realm, the human realm. They take rebirth in what's called the form realm, usually in what's the pure abodes. And then they achieve final liberation, final nirvana there. And they never come back again to this sensual realm of existence. Then the next level, lower level, there are in this teaching, in this Dhamma, bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters. These are the three lowest fetters, view of self, doubt, and the clinging to rules and observances. And they've weakened lust, hatred, and delusion. So these are once returners, they come back to this world, the human world, or it could be the heavenly worlds, the sensual heavenly worlds, they come back one more time and then put an end to samsara, the round of rebirths. Okay, then we come to the next level. This is the first level of actual realization he says, there are those monks who have abandoned the three fetters. Again, view of self, doubt, clinging to rules and observances. And they are all stream enterers. They've entered the stream to liberation. They will no longer, they have no lo they're no longer subject to perdition. Maybe the word perdition, it's an unusual word. Let's say, they no longer subject to rebirth in the lower realms of existence, the three lower realms, the hell realms, the animal realm, and the realm of the afflicted spirits, sometimes called hungry ghosts. So they don't take rebirth in these three lower realms, and they are bound for liberation, and they're heading for some bodhi for full enlightenment. So it's said of these disciples that they take rebirth at most seven more times before they reach full liberation. Okay, then we go to the next paragraph. The Buddha says, in this Dhamma well proclaimed by me and so on, there are bhikkhus who are they're called Dhamma followers or faith followers. These are disciples who have entered the path to liberation. They haven't yet reached any, even the lowest stage of realization, but they've entered the path and they're bound to reach at least the lowest stage of realization, 
within this very life itself. So they're bound to become stream enterers in this life. And then eventually they will reach the full enlightenment. Okay, then finally the Buddha adds, and this is a bit unusual, this paragraph, he says, this Dhamma is well proclaimed by me and so on. In this Dhamma well proclaimed by me, clear, open, evident, free of patchwork, those who have sufficient faith in me, who have sufficient love for me or devotion to me, are all headed for heaven. <laughs> It seems that that's maybe a little bit of a Christian flavor here, <laughs> a little bit like a theistic flavor, except that for Buddhism, heaven is not the final goal. You know, it's not nirvana, but it's a realm, a happy realm of existence, and one is reborn in the heavenly realm through the power of merit, of wholesome karma. So if one has real deep faith in the Buddha and real sincere love and devotion towards the Buddha, that creates a lot of merit. Of course, one has to be observing the basic principles of morality, of sila, also practicing generosity. I don't think the Buddha would say <laughs> that somebody might be killing, stealing, lying, womanizing, but he goes to the vihara or the temple every two weeks, bows down to the Buddha image, offers incense, flowers, fruits, then goes home and thinks, I'm heading for heaven. <laughs> but the person will have to be living according to the Dhamma, and based on that person's understanding of the Dhamma, they have a real sincere faith, in the sense of a trusting confidence in the Buddha and a devotion towards the Buddha based on a recognition of the Buddha's excellent qualities, his great wisdom, great compassion, great purity, his skill in teaching many beings. And so that mind of faith, mind of trust, mind of love and devotion generates powerful, wholesome karma, which becomes a condition for a rebirth in heaven. But this person has to understand, of course, that the rebirth in heaven, it's not the goal of the teaching. It's, at best, it can be a temporary resting station. But the person will have to continue to strive on to develop the, especially the samadhi and panya, concentration and insight in order to gain realization or liberation. Okay, so this takes us through the discourse on the snake simile. Any questions? Please. Okay, maybe just... Yeah. Um, as an example, a stream enterer, someone who uh, reached stream entry and uh, is being reborn, yeah. won't be reborn in the lower uh, yeah. rooms, but has to go through reaching stream entry again, or oh, not? After being reborn? Yes. No, no. Once he's become a stream enterer, he doesn't have to go through the same attainment again. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it will probably take some time till that person reaches what we would call the age of reason, some degree of maturity, before what I would assume is that they would feel a kind of natural affinity towards the Buddha and the Dharma, and then they will start, as soon as they're able to, maybe to start taking up the practice of meditation. They will naturally have a good observance of precepts. Would you attain a level of maturity? 
Yeah, yeah. Sincerely. Uh, thank you. And another question. Um, in terms of the lower fetter of observance of rituals and letting go of the rituals, uh, how do we explain like having the biggest Buddha and, <laughs> and the bowing and all these rituals yeah. that people yeah. are still yeah. led to follow yeah. in some ways? Okay, first, actually, the Pali expression, sila bhattu, sila bhattu paramasa, I don't think translating it as um, clinging to rites and rituals is a correct translation. I think that was a translation introduced by an early generation of like Protestant translators and maybe agnostic translators who are somewhat critical of Roman Catholic Church for emphasizing so much ritualistic, even the Church of England, they were English translators, Church of England, of relying so much on rituals. But the way the commentar commentaries and other texts explain Sila Bhatta, they explain it in terms of practices of the Brahmins and other ascetics. Well, actually, some of them were ritualistic like making the fire sacrifices, um, undertaking certain types of ascetic observances, like long fasts, um, exposing the body to the fire so that one would be able to withstand the heat of the fire, going out naked during the middle of the winter and diving into cold rivers, um, we find like whole list of them in the suttas. For example, sutta number twelve. Some of these practices. Like on page one seventy three. The Buddha explains a number of these ascetic practices. These were types of sila bhatta. Okay, but now coming back to the regular Buddhist rituals, what I would say is that ritual can be useful as a way of channeling one's feelings of devotion, reverence, veneration, respect. And so, as Buddhists with some understanding, we don't reject rituals. But what we would reject is the idea that just performing the ritual in a mechanical, automatized way is going to be a means of creating merit or getting wholesome karma. But if one does like bowing, it goes back to the time of the Buddha, it's in old Indian or even a general Asian way of showing respect and honor to somebody who is extremely worthy, um, offering things like incense and candles. They each have their symbolic significance, but it's a way of offering things, a kind of self, a symbolic type of self-surrender by surrendering things, by offering things that are valuable and beautiful. Thank you. Okay, okay. Let him take, please take the... Yeah, good question. Uh, the five yeah, those are just the Pali words, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the Vinyana is the consciousness. Vinyana is what's translated into consciousness. Uh, about the heaven, your description is very similar to pure land. Yeah. Pure land. yeah. Uh, is there a Pali word for heaven? Was it, I mean, it gets translated as heaven. Yeah, there is a Pali word. It actually goes back even to based on the Vedic word, the word in Vedic Sanskrit is Svarga. In the Pali it becomes Sadga. And so the heavens are just, they're conditioned realms of existence. 
whereas the Pure Land is supposed to be a realm that it's almost like a special group of heavens that are reserved for non-returners. Like the non-returners are reborn in these, they're actually called pure abodes. And then once they're reborn there, then they don't fall away back to other types of rebirth. And so the Pure Land seemed to be modeled on the pure abodes of the early Buddhism. Okay, any further questions? Okay, please take the uh, mobile microphone. Um, it's about the uh, bioactivists. Um, are they mind fabrication to them? Are they what? Mind fabrication, the mind made provision. It's, um, let's, for example, uh, the eye with the contact, yeah. the consciousness. That consciousness is that mind produced, so the mind grasps to it. It's that the consciousness is the m- aspect of the mind itself. We don't say that the so, con- consciousness is, is not mind produced, but the consciousness is the mind which is doing the producing. <laughs> so, it's, 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 it's the mind object there. The consciousness. Yes. No, consciousness itself is not a mind object, because consciousness is what is aware. So, the object is distinct from the consciousness. So, say the visual consciousness, it's the consciousness which is aware of visible objects. Or hearing consciousness is consciousness which is aware of sounds. The sound is the object, the consciousness is what is aware of the sound. Yeah, the storyline is is the mind produced that storyline, so we grasp to those storylines. Of course, the mind produces many, what we call storylines and narratives, and that production of narrative or storyline becomes something of the basis for our sense of grasping to the I, to the sense of personal identity. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want to take some of these questions from the internet. Okay, Buddhist texts refer to the gods. Buddhists these days seem somewhat equivocal about the existence of a creator god. Is that to avoid religious conflicts? Is that right view? I don't know that Buddhists today are equivocal about the existence of a creator god. I would say that Buddhism is quite um, straightforward and says that at least according to the Buddhist teaching, that there is no creator God. But I don't think that this should be presented in an aggressive, um, antagonistic way, intended to inflame followers of other religions. But when we have like religious discussions, we just speak about from the Buddhist point of view, the world or universe is without a beginning in time. And so the idea of a creator God becomes unnecessary. But we try also to find what is really of value in the idea of a creator god, like some principle of cosmic justice, some way of certifying the value of good actions, like generosity, kindness, love, self-sacrifice for others. And then we affirm that, but without affirming the creator god. Okay, in practice, how does one abandon consciousness is it possible without samatha or jhana state samadhi? <clears throat> okay, one abandons consciousness by seeing the consciousness as being not mine, not I, not myself, to the point that one is able to cut off identification with the consciousness. So that would really take place, probably when we say it's only the arahat who has completely abandoned consciousness. Then is this possible without training in samatha or jhana? This is a point which is being debated amongst Buddhists. Um, According to the mainstream Theravada tradition, there is, and not only the Theravada, but some of the other early schools, there is a possibility for developing insight without relying on the training in samatha or jhana. Through the power of very sharp insight, one could gain 
even the stage of once returner, a uh, stage of stream entry, once returner, perhaps non returner, and even arahat. But probably in order to ensure a greater stability for the development of wisdom, it would be desirable to develop samatha or samadhi to some extent. And this is my opinion, others will have different opinions. <laughs> okay. Uh, question seven, can we say that the consciousness of an arahat is traceable because we cannot find it in any other person but only in that particular enlightened person? <laughs> if that's what is meant by traceable, then I think one could say that the consciousness is traceable. Okay, I think we'll stop now and then we'll come back after lunch for a discussion period. Um, before we end, I just want to mention, next week we'll have the class. No, I'm sorry. Next week is, this is April 24th. Next week is May 1st. Next week there's no class because we're having this three-day Dhamma retreat here. And I'd encourage those who are interested to have like a full weekend at the monastery to register for the Dharma retreat. I think you register on Thursday evening or afternoon? Evening. And then you spend here all day Friday, Saturday, and then we continue half a day on Sunday. And then in the Sunday afternoon, there's a special ceremony for the um, honoring the deceased, the people who have, who have died, that's held every year in the spring. Okay, so our next Sutta study class will be May 8th, Saturday, May 8th. And according to the schedule that I had sent out earlier, I had that the next class will be on Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 24. But I reflected on that. I think it would be more interesting to go skip that Sutta and take Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 28. This is the Greater Discourse on the Elephant's Footprint. I'll also put this in an announcement to go out before the class. So then we'll have classes May 8th and May 15th we'll have classes. And Sutta number 28 will almost certainly extend over two classes since it takes time to explain. Okay, we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So, from speaking, on, from doing the meditation, speaking on Dhamma, listening to Dhamma, discussing Dhamma, we accumulate wholesome karma. Now we share this wholesome karma with the deities, the Nagas, the Bhutas or fear spirits, asking them to be well and happy and to protect the world, the Buddha Dhamma, and ourselves. Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Mangparang Etavata Cham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe de vanumo dantu, sabe sampati siddhya, sabe bhutanumo dantu, sabe sampati siddhya, sabe satanumo dantu, sabe sampati siddhya, bhavagu padaya vici hetato, etantare satakayupapana, rupi arupicha, Asanya sanino, dukkha pamuchantu, 
Phosanto Nibhutin.